Thank you everyone for joining us for another Broadloom webinar on this really beautiful Wednesday afternoon. My name is Todd and I'm the CEO at Broadloom here. And I'm super excited today to talk about a Q1 macro look back. What we're gonna do is we're gonna dive into the data and we're gonna look at some of the recession trends and what you can do to um, get yourself out of this slowdown that we've seen over the last couple of months. We're gonna look at the difference between written sales and delivered sales. We're going to look at some of the other macro headwinds that are affecting just overall consumer demand. And then at the end of this uh, webinar, we'll stay on for another 30, 45 minutes to answer any questions live. So again, we're going to start with a Q1 look back. Now, overall, growth is slowing, right? And, and honestly, if you compare anything to 2021 or 2020, we all knew growth would slow. But what does that mean by the numbers? Uh, what we're seeing is that from a volume perspective, retailers are down about 6%. It's really about 5.9%. And when uh, the industry did some surveying, um, and we used some third-party tools to look at this, what we found was that 25% of retailers are seeing over double-digit declines. So on average, there's about a 6% decrease in volume. Um, but 25% of retailers are seeing double-digit declines. And that makes sense, right? There's some people on one side of the curve that are seeing double-digit declines. There may even be some retailers that are up year over year, which is why the average is about a 6% decrease. Now, knowing that there's a decrease, and we all know that there's slowing is happening, um, there is some good news and there is some bad news. Now, the bad news is that during recessionary times, um, Flooring is always affected first. The reason flooring is affected first, and we are as an industry, is because we are highly correlated to income level. If you look at some of these charts right here, you can see we are highly correlated to income level, which makes us the most affected um, or the first affected when there's a pullback and rates rise and interest rates rise and demand slows. So the bad news is that flooring was affected first. Now, on the contrary, the good news is that flooring will rebound first, right? Flooring is always the first to come out of these things. So when you look at some of this data presented, you know, I know it was tough over the last few months for a lot of us in Q1, but it's going to get tougher for the lot, all these other industries after us, whether that's um, kitchen and bath, lighting, siding, roofing, if you kind of look at this chart here. But as they're entering the harder times that we're in right now, will be out of the hard times first. So the way I look at this is, yes, it's been a pretty tough Q1. It'll probably be a pretty tough Q2, but we'll start to come out of things in the Q3, Q4 area, and we'll be the first industry to come out of it. So there is, although there's bad news, I do believe that most of the bad news has, you know, we're kind of in the middle of the bad news and the good news is ahead of us when it comes to demand. Now, when you kind of summarize all of this, we looked at written and delivered sales, right? Because I think that's at the end of the day what people want to look at. Consumer demand is one thing, but what is the industry impact when it comes to actual written and delivered sales? And written sales, just to kind of delineate the difference between the two, written sales are more of a leading indicator of delivered sales, right? Because you can write sales today, but deliver them four months ago. And we're still delivering sales today and in Q1, that we wrote in Q4 or Q3. So written sales is really the right indicator to look at, although delivered sales is what hits your, you know, your P&L and your, your wallets. Written sales is really the indicator of what's happening. And when you looked at actual sales numbers, not just general um, you know, volume and search volume and, and consumer demand, written sales are down in our industry on the retail side about 13%. And delivered sales are down about 4%. So what that tells me is that um, we still have a backlog of work from Q4 and Q3. I'm sure you guys all know that. And we're going to talk about that here in a second. About um, We're going to talk about that with all of the you know, shipping problems and the freight issues and the um, you know, Uyghur Act, um, which we'll get into here in a second. But again, written sales down 13% is an indicator of what Q2 is going to look like. Delivered sales down 4% in Q1 is more of an indicator of what Q4 looked like. So that's why I expect 
Q2 written uh, delivered sales to be down more than 4%. But I think written sales are going to slowly creep up from minus 13 to minus 10 to minus 8. And like I said, into Q3 and Q4, we should see us slowly get out of this. And you can see kind of some of that in some of these charts. Now, we talked about, you know, we just talked about, we went all the way to the bottom. We talked about sales, written sales, delivered sales, and overall volume. But I want to kind of make our way back up so you can see the trends and what's happening. So let's talk about surge volume. So as you can see on this graph right here, what I looked at was what is the search volume, consumer search volume on Google specifically, which is a really good indicator of you know everything, um, for people searching flooring store and flooring installation. So let me stop right here and tell you why I chose flooring store and flooring installation as the indicator keywords. Uh, we looked at about $40 million of paid advertising data and consumer search volume. And what we found was that 96% of searches didn't mention a single flooring brand. And over 45% of those searches mentioned the word flooring store or flooring installation as, as kind of the main part of the search. That's why uh, I used flooring store and flooring installation as the main keywords here to look at indicators of search volume because only 4% of people mention brands Almost everyone, almost every consumer says flooring store in city or flooring store near me or flooring installation in city. So by looking at these two specific keywords, it's a really good indicator of what's happening. Now, what you can see here, obviously, is over the last 18 months, volume has been down, right? But it's actually starting to stabilize. And you can kind of see that right here on the graph. Uh, flooring installation is down. Flooring store searches are down. And what I want you to notice here is it's been 18 months. But what I talked about a minute ago was Q4 written sales affecting Q1 written sales and and delivered sales. So we, I, I kind of you kind of got to look at this like a, a pyramid or leading indicators. We started at sales. Now we're looking at volume. So volume is a really good leading indicator of of uh, written sales which is a really good indicator of delivered sales and delivered sales is the money in your pocket. So what I want to do is I, again, in this presentation, I want to keep looking up funnel so that we can see the highest level indicator that will tell us things are either going to keep going down. So let's keep planning for the worst or things are starting to look up as a leading indicator. And although things might feel bad right now, let's, con let's plan for an uptick in demand. And this, this is the same exact data that we looked at during COVID when we accurately predicted that things were going to pop because there was so much consumer demand. These are the same exact trends that we're looking at here today. So again, on this slide, what you'll see is leading indicator, a higher level indicator, but a leading indicator that search volume has been down, not just for the last two quarters, literally it's been on a downward trend for the last 18 months. So diving deeper into consumer demand, we pulled a report from Flexport. Flexport is probably the leader in um, international freight. And what this graph is showing here, uh, just to reiterate probably the last slide that I had, is that consumer demand is down essentially, and this breaks it down by month, to the same levels of May 2020, right? So if you look at that, um, if you look at that blue that blue line, you can see the blue line, which measures durable goods, right? Durable goods, meaning uh, products that are bought and um, that are used or held on to for more than three years. If you look at the durable goods again, that dark blue line, you can see that it doesn't touch that middle at 10% until all the way back at May, 2020. And then obviously below, you can see that light green line, that's actually non-durable goods. So non-durable goods, the uh, demand has completely fallen off, right? You can see since what, September, 2021, it has gone down the wayside. But durable goods have kind of remained consistent or back to roughly May, 2020 levels. And then you can obviously see in May, 2021, a huge spike in demand. Uh, but what's really interesting to see is during this uncertain times, people are still, you know, there's still some amount of demand for these um, durable goods that people use for over three years, obviously that being flooring. So again, uh, this just continues, continues to tell the same story that over the last 18, you know, here maybe it's 24 months or 30, 30 months, we've seen demand slow, but it's not as slow as you would predict. 
Um, there's a lot other industries that are going a lot slower, especially if you were in non-durable goods. If you guys, you know, you have friends or family in the non-durable goods space, products that were, you know, used for less than three years, I'm sure they could tell you things are a lot slower than they are in the flooring industry. So that's um, the leading indicator on general volume. But then we wanted to go higher and say, well, if we're looking at just general volume, which are there specific products that are having an increase or a decrease in demand, or is it just general volume? So what we looked at was hardwood flooring and vinyl plank flooring. And there's been a huge trend here since 2020, right? We all know this. That's not a secret. I'm not providing any interesting insights there. But vinyl exploded, right, in popularity over the last, what, three to five years. And in 2020, what we found really interesting when looking at the data, and you can see that in the first kind of square here, is in 2020, for the first time ever, searches for vinyl plank exceeded searches for hardwood flooring. And you can see that red line finally in 2020 cross over that blue line. But now what's really interesting is if you look in Q1 23, the volume is nearly identical, right? Look how close those lines are compared to where the lines were before in 2020. So what this is showing me is that um, consumers were all about vinyl plank in 2020, 2021. I mean, it's skyrocketed. Look at this graph. But now heading into Q1 23, the volume for hardwood and vinyl is really, really similar, right? So the mix is starting to change. And listen, we've seen this, right? Like we all knew this was gonna happen. You talk to any flooring retailer, anyone on the manufacturer side, and they say it is insane the amount of vinyl plank brands that are coming into our industry. What could be happening here is a few things. We could just be exhausting the amount of vinyl options and consumers are exhausted by the experience of having 10,000 brands that are going back to hardwood. Maybe um, people are starting to recognize that hard, uh, vinyl is not a replacement for hardwood, whereas I think a lot of people thought it was over the last, you know, multiple years. Um, or, you know, and we'll talk about this here in a minute, vinyl's having some freight and shipping problems, right? There's a, um, a lot of acts going on. There's a lot of new laws going on that are preventing a lot of the supply to come into the U.S. So there's been a lot of back orders, and that might be what is pushing people to go back to the hardwood side. I don't really know why this is happening per se, uh, but it's happening and I want to make sure we're all aware of it. So when you dive in kind of further into that, I, I mentioned this here a minute ago and I mentioned freight and shipping. Um, so freight and shipping is a huge thing that we talk about here on vinyl when we talk about vinyl plank and the imports. And I believe that uh, customers are used to, consumers are used to getting things same day, next day, within a week, right? We've all been trained to have this Amazon-like mindset, for better or for worse, right? I'm not going to comment on if it's better or worse, but um, we have this mindset of we expect when we buy something, it gets delivered to us right away. And I can promise you that consumers are exhausted of having things out of stock, not ready. And that could be why, um, and that could be why more hardwood searches are happening now instead of final plank searches. But what this graph is showing, and again, this graph is um, provided by Flexport. Thanks for them for sharing this. This shows eastward and westward um, freight levels, right? So how long it's taking the average day's freight uh, stays on the ocean, right? Ocean freight. So what you can see here is in October, if you look at like October 21 or January 22, if you look at kind of that graph, it spikes, right? It took the most days possible to be out in freight. I think it took on average 300 days to get something you know, across the sea to us. Well, what's happening here is we're back to normal, right? In April, it took on average 150 days. This is levels we haven't seen since basically the beginning of pandemic. So during the pandemic, you can see this climb, right? All freight went to, it was a, for lack of better words, it was a shit show, right? We all we all know that. Uh, it was really hard to get imports. The supply chain was a total mess. Well, the truth is supply chain is actually back to where it was right around the beginning of COVID. So all of the COVID impact is no longer there. I'm not going to say that like it's now amazing and we're getting things so quickly. I think there's always room to optimize that. But, um, but 
I would say that most of the demand today for most of the slowdown, most of the change in demand to hardwood, and um, most of the slowdown is not due to freight and shipping times. There are other things that are affecting general freight and shipping times, but it is not the actual supply chain itself. Again, it's more legislation that's happening, and we're going to talk about that again here in a few minutes. But again, what I want to show here is everyone wants to blame, oh, you know, supply chain's messed up, COVID screwed up supply chain. The truth is we're back to pre-COVID. That's no longer an excuse. And it's just, um, you know, it's kind of all worked its way out of the system. So I've mentioned this now a, a few times, and I want to dive into what's called the Uyghur Forced Labor Protection Act. This is what I believe is actually affecting vinyl supply more than anything. And when I talk to manufacturer and supplier and distributor partners, they all talk about this. Although I think in the flooring industry, we don't talk about kind of political things that are happening too much that are affecting supply chain. It's not the actual supply chain. It's the legislation that is affecting um, our ability to get material. And again, that could lead to an increase in the slowdown. So we could have been down, you know, 10% in written sales instead of what we're at now. We could have been down at 5% of written sales for all we know, because we can't actually write these sales because customer might not want to pull the trigger. So there is an act happening right now. It's called the Uyghur Forced Labor Protection Act out of China. And essentially what happened was in 2020, the U.S. Department of State and a whole bunch of other agencies advised companies, you know, doing business in in the Xinjiang area of China, that they need to do due diligence on all of their manufacturing and all of their imports to make sure that forced labor was not used in any supply chains tied to U.S. imports. And listen, I think we all agree that's that's important. We don't want forced labor, child labor on any of our products, but I think the U.S. Department of state really jumped in in 2020 and said, we're going to start taking a stance on this, especially in this area of China. So please make sure anything you're importing from this area, you really place a, a close attention to. Now, the truth is, um, the US State of Department says a lot of these things a lot and doesn't necessarily always act on it. And it's not super easy for a manufacturer or a supplier to just all of a sudden steer the ship in a different direction and start getting products from somewhere else. But I do believe this is one of the main impacts of what's driving um, a decrease in sales outside of obviously rates increasing and volume going down. This is just another headwind that we're facing, right? And what I want to do is bring this to your attention and, and talk about what we can do about it. So we said in 2020, again, the U.S. Department of State announced this. And then in 2023, in Q1, U.S. Customs began inspections, right? Inspections on every import and more importantly, enforcement of the UFLPA. Now, to import those products, you need to have documentation to prove that both finished goods and raw go goods were not made with forced labor. It is required for every single import, right? So what's happening now is you have this middleman who's now making sure that you have this um, documentation. So no matter what, even if you have the documentation, it'll slow down the import, right? So you'll, we're going to go back. Although the freight gets here in 150 days, right? Again, with our previous slide we talked about, the freight is getting here in really good time, but you're not getting it because it's stuck at customs. So I want to make sure you understand the difference here of the freight is coming and it's not a supply chain issue anymore. Like we're back to pre-COVID levels. I showed you that graph. We can show it to you again. We're back to 150 days, which is about the average where we want to be pre-COVID. But we're having now a customs issue, which is why you're not able to get a lot of these materials. You add that on top of decreased demand and more people searching for hardwood. You kind of have the perfect storm of a slowdown. Uh, but again, we'll talk about at the end how we can get out of this. So it's estimated that about $80 million of vinyl plank flooring has been rejected and yet to pass inspections at customs, right? And I've talked to a lot of manufacturers, I've talked to a lot of suppliers, some of the best selling products from basically every supplier are depleted because they can't get that material, all that material is stuck in customs, right? So it's a huge, huge issue right now. And if you look at this by the numbers, US vinyl manufacturing capacity. So if we, you know, I think everyone says, well, why don't we just, 
manufacture vinyl in the U.S. I think that's a great idea, and I applaud anyone doing that. But the truth is, the numbers today show that U.S. vinyl manufacturing capacity is less than 15% demand. So if we really want to meet demand, we have to go overseas to get the other 85%. And the truth is almost all the films, right? So the film on top of the, the vinyl, um, almost all the films and the moldings are still made in China. So even if we brought all the manufacturing to the US, sure, we'd get over this Uyghur issue. There would be no more um, supply chain issues. There would be no more customs issues and hopefully no forced labor. But how about the 85% of the rest of the demand, right? Like we have to do something about that. So um at the end of the day, like there's a few things that we can do to try to around this, but it's not just impacting, it's not just impacting you as a local retailer. It's also impacting the box stores, but in a slightly different way. So if you look at Home Depot and Lowe's, they are getting inventory because they have contracts with all of these ma big manufacturers and big brands where they get fined if they're out of stock. So they're ending up getting the first inventory before any of us. Um, but if you look at suppliers and manufacturers that are not working with the big box stores, they're they're showing you know pretty good inventory. So what I'm trying you to see here is that if you have a if you're working with a manufacturer supplier that sells to Home Depot and or Lowe's, they are contractually obligated or they get fined for being out of stock to give product to Home Depot and Lowe's essentially first. Like I don't want to get to the nomenclature of their contracts, but essentially Home Depot and Lowe's have contracts with major suppliers and can find them for being out of stock. So when the major manufacturers finally get their products out of, out of customs, they have to give to Home Depot and Lowe's first, which is why they're out of stock on a lot of their best sellers. We expect at Broadloom and some of the information that we've got that in about four to eight weeks, a lot of this stuff should clear out, right? This is kind of a short-term pain um, and over the next four to six, eight weeks, a lot of this should clear through customs and we should get a better process in place that they should start going. But it's, you know, it's a small cog in the wheel that ends up, you know, stopping the flow of, of product to you and to your consumer. So there's two things that you can do. And this isn't groundbreaking, but it's something to at least remember. Now is the time that you can recommend wood, laminate or tile and not just go to vinyl. And I showed you that searches are increasing for wood. It's about the same amount as vinyl. So now is a better time than ever to recommend wood to your customers that maybe thought they wanted vinyl because that's all we've been marketing and that's all I've been telling them. It's a really good time to talk to them about wood because they can get that product faster and demand is just about equal. And then lastly, and, and I hope you're all doing this, but make sure you always check stock, please. You know, if you sell a customer and you're using an ERP system like a uh, Broadloom business management system, you can check inventory, but sometimes you have to call. Either way, check inventory before you sell that product or at bare minimum, after you sell that product, please do not set um, a date of install before you check stock and actually get that material in. I hear tons of stories from retailers saying, oh, this was back order. Now my my install has to get pushed back and the customer is upset. Bare minimum, don't do that. If I was talking to a customer, I would say, listen, supply for this product, is, it's been in such demand that supply is going up and down, but we'll definitely have it in with, if not in a week, in a few weeks. Uh, once we get the product in, then we're happy to schedule an install just to make sure it's all working well. Let's set real good expectations with customers and talk about, um, you know, talk about that up front because no one wants to be surprised, right? So, Anyway, this is the vinyl supply chain challenges. I wanted to make sure I talked about this because everyone wants to blame it on freight and shipping, but the truth is it's more of a, um, it's more of a, I don't want to call it political, but it's more of a uh, higher level issue that uh, the U.S. Department of State has put on us. It's not the actual freight and shipping problems. So throughout this presentation, again, we kind of started at, uh, we started at general demand and we kind of made our way up to search demand and, and volume. Then we kind of talked about freight and shipping and we're kind of looking for these indicators. But the one thing we didn't talk about that I just saw in the chat and I'm happy is to, to address this is we've talked about vinyl, we've talked about hardwood, we've talked about products, we've talked about search volume. 
why does no one talk about carpet? And that's a good question. Like, why does no one talk about carpet? I'm not sure because when you look at volume of searches, again, this isn't necessarily what they're buying, but I think we're pushing people away and our marketing has pushed people away. But if you look at searches, overall volume on Google, carpet is still king, right? Carpet is still the king of online search volume. Uh, I don't, I, if you don't believe me, that's fine. Just believe Google. Look at the yellow line, which is carpet search compared to vinyl plank flooring or hardwood flooring searches. It is night and day. Now, again, this may not lead into sales, but I think that's because we have trained our salespeople. We have trained our staff. We have trained our marketing departments that carpet's not good, right? Carpet's not good. And it, honestly, over the last few years, we've trained people to say hardwood stinks, right? Sell vinyl. It's waterproof. It's scratch proof. We have to go back to the way the industry used to be and sell based on what the customer comes in and what their situation is because a, that's a better customer experience. And B, demand says that there's there's people want carpet and people want hardwood. It's not just vinyl everywhere. It's just we've exploded in vinyl popularity over the last five years. So anyway, thanks for bringing that up. You teed me up perfectly. Uh, carpet is still king on volume and don't be afraid to sell it. So we looked at everything here, right? And just to summarize what we've looked at so far, we looked at sales volume, written volume. We looked at delivered volume looked at search volume. We looked at freight um, freight issues and freight timing. We then looked at the Uyghur Act and we're kind of making our way all the way up just to say, what can we look at that can point us in the direction of things are going to keep going this way or things are going to keep go up from now on, right? And that's what we're trying to get to. So some of the other indicators we looked at when going through this report was, all right, well, we only have so much data, right? Abroad, we only have so much data. As retailers, we only have so much data. But, you know, there's these huge flooring companies like Empire or Lumber Liquidators or, you know, sorry, LL Flooring that has a ton of data. So what are they doing, right? What are they seeing? Because if we can match what they're seeing and doing versus what we're doing, maybe we can really tell a perfect story. So the next thing we did in our research of kind of looking back at Q1 and trying to figure out what's going to happen in Q2 was we looked at Empire. And what we wanted to look at was, you know, Empire spends a ton of money. Right. People know Empire is one of the best at SEO, paid digital marketing, PPC, Google ads, you name it. And what we wanted to look at was what are the top five, we really looked at the top three. What are the top three paid keywords that Empire is using right now? And what I found stunning was that not only are they um, zigging when others zagging, I mean, they're dumping their money into carpet, right? So if you look, here are the top three keywords that they spend money on. Carpet, bath rugs, which I don't understand, but maybe that's a throw on sale. So someone please explain that to me. And then empire carpet. Those are the three top keywords that they're spending money on. So what this shows me is they're doing two things, right? They're zigging while others are zagging, right? Everyone here is fighting over vinyl and hardwood. They're happy to take a lower percent of the market, but a larger piece of that by going after carpet right now, which completely is a change of strategy. One. And two, uh, they see this mix changing, like just the same thing that the trends I'm showing you and the volume I'm showing you. And, um, you know, in recessions, you see people kind of go after more carpet than other things. They see this ahead of time. And this is a this is another data point that you guys have to sell more than just vinyl. Number one and number two, that things are slowing down and the mix is changing. Don't take it from me. Take it from Empire. So after looking at Empire, we said, all right, that's interesting. That kind of fits our narrative really, really well. Um, but how about LL Flooring and Floor and Decor? What's happening there? So what we did was obviously they're both publicly traded. So we looked at their financials and their financial reporting. And both of them are reporting decreases in gross margin and year on year same store sales, right? So the same store is doing less sales this year than they did last year. If you kind of look at the bullet points on the right, what you'll see is Floor and Decor went out to the markets and said, we expect relatively weak sales in 2023 with guidance for minus 3%, uh, it decreased 3% in sales compared to the same store last year. Again, that's that's uh, delivered sales. So if, if Floor and Decor expects 3% decrease, 
I would expect the average flooring store to get about a, you know, five, maybe a six to 10% decrease, which is right in line to the data we showed you earlier. And if Floor and Decor is going to say this to the public and say this to their investors and get their stock price hit, I promise you this is accurate. The next thing Floor and, Floor and Decor announced was that um, in 20, that uh, Q4 2022, comparable stores ended actually up two and a half percent. Um, so what they're saying is Q4 2022 was actually better than Q4 2021. I thought the last bullet point here, though, was probably the most interesting and something that we talk about a ton. In LL Flooring's um, presentation, they said they expect adjusted gross margins to improve year over year with more strength heading into the second half of 2023. This is expected to be driven by lower sourcing costs, which makes sense because freight and shipping rates are going down. But if you look at the point right below, LL Flooring's adjusted gross margin was 36.2% in 2022, down from 37.6% in 2021. Their margins are decreasing. And what they came out and said, and I want you to see this point on the on the left, they made a stance and they said they are pushing for to now only start selling higher margin products, right? They need to get their margin back up. 36% is not good enough. And they said this publicly at their earnings. Um, it's down from 37.6%. So what they're doing is they're re-looking at their showrooms and they're saying, where do I make money? Where am I making higher margins? Which products can't be shopped? Where am I actually making money? And they are going to make a huge push this year and next year to only sell their higher margin products. And I think you as local retailers can think about the same thing. You have a million products in your showroom. The market is, is declining, right? So you have to, when a customer comes in, you only have X amount of customers, whereas before you had X plus five, right? You have less customers that are coming in. That's your chance. You have to sell the higher margin products. Do not bring in every product into your showroom only bring in the products that you can make money. Don't take it from me. Take it from lumber liquidators. Take it from floor decor. I promise you, you only have so many at-bats and you have to make as much money as possible in these at-bats, especially during slower times. So um, again, let's learn something from these guys. I know there are big competitors, but they have a lot of data and a lot of research that we can learn from. Now, we all know that Lumber liquidators, floor and decor empire spend a ton of money on advertising, a ton, right? And I have someone just texting me. So again, thank you for teeing me up perfectly that, um, hey, they spend so much money, they can just increase their sales volume by spending more money um, and kind of pushing that downstream. So what we looked at and we knew this would come up is what is going on with our marketing, right? Like what is going on with retailer marketing? How are things going? What are the trends on Google? So we reached out to our friends at Google and we actually got some interesting information about local retailer marketing as compared to LL flooring and floor and decor's marketing. So if you see here, uh, these are graphs. I think this is about a, a, a few years of data. I think we looked at 2018 to 2013, essentially. It's something like 40 or $50 million of ad data. And we appreciate Google and our partners there for kind of helping us out with this. Um, I want you to look at both of these graphs. The top graph is click-through rate and conversion rate. So what you'll see in Q4 2018, the click-through rate was 1.2%. So that's the rate of which consumers click on your ads and then get to your site. Uh, and the conversion rate was just at about, you know, 3%. Um, the, at this time, right, you can see that the that the rates are kind of like very, very close to each other. You kind of see the blue line and the red line. Look all the way to Q1 2023. And for the first time ever, you see actual click-through rate graphs start to go above where the conversion rate is going. That hasn't happened in forever. So what this is telling us is people are clicking at a higher rate than they're actually buying. So there is this interest right? There is this amount of interest, but people aren't necessarily pulling the trigger. And we haven't really seen this convergence happen in a lot of years. But where I want to get this conversation to is that look at the cost per conversion over the years. Now, this is a sensitive topic for me because depending on who you're talking to, people like to measure conversions as, you know, clicks on a location page or 
someone got radius targeting around your store and someone came to your store and, you know, searched for something. I, I want to get down to the real, what is a cost per conversion? A phone call over a minute, a phone call, uh, sorry, a form fill or a sample order. There's nothing else that's a conversion in my mind. Phone call, sample order or form fill. That's it. None of this other, you know, fluff around it. If you look at this, and again, we worked with Google on this, so I feel very good about this data. Cost per conversions are up, right? From $58 to $62, all the way up to about $71 now. What this shows is that it has never been harder to advertise online where it was much easier before. But the reason is it's not because of necessarily recessionary stuff. It's because the lumber liquidators and floor and decor are dumping so much money into advertising to keep their revenue afloat. I think John Weller talks about this a bit. And he said, you know, during the recession, everyone was slowing down in 2008, but all the box stores grew like crazy. Why? Because they dumped a whole bunch of money in digital advertising because they could, and they kept all these customers. And then these customers became repeat customers while everyone else in the industry was pulling back. So what I'll tell you is, although cost per conversions are rising, it's rising for everyone that does not mean that you should pull back. What you should do is when that customer comes in the door, do not be afraid to sell them hardwood. Don't be afraid to sell them tile or carpet. Don't just shove vinyl down their throats like we've done you know, forever. And two, when that customer comes in the door, which obviously right now there will be fewer, sell the products that can't be shopped and sell the products that you can make a higher margin. Please, please, please make sure you do that. So anyway, I'm, I'm just about out of time, but I want to kind of summarize this whole thing. Uh, in summary, and then I'll get into kind of some of the data here, but in summary, volume is slow, right? Volume is slow. Flooring retailers get hit first. They're the first industry. We, we are the first industry to get hit because of how tied we are to um, kind of the lower bracket of income level. However, we are the first industry to get out of that problem, and we will be the first industry out we also looked at search volume and sales differences. We saw that sales are uh, written sales are down. I think we, you know, above ten percent, um, and delivered sales are down just about four percent. So we can expect Q two to be a little bit slower um, in delivered because Q one was a leading indicator. We saw uh, the changes in consumer search volume. We looked at um, freight and. Uh, logistics, what's happening on the ocean of us getting the products. That's not a problem anymore. But what is the problem is the big Uyghur Act. So we've kind of seen a whole bunch of spirals happen. But in summary, I actually took a screenshot from um, one of my favorite um, research papers out there. And, and I'll talk about that right here is that growth is slowing, right? It's definitely slowing, especially if you compare it to uh, COVID times. But with that said, we are about to enter the worst of it, which is the bad news. And the good news is that we're the first to get out of it. So if I told you that we're going to get out of this, as, as long as we we have to get to the worst to get to the best, we'd all want to get to the worst as quickly as possible. And the good news is we're getting to the worst as quickly as possible, but the best is, is here to come. Um, there is a long-term impact on is vinyl plank going to continue to be this popular? So please don't just jam your showrooms with a bunch of vinyl plank. There are other products to sell that aren't affected by um, the U.S. state of department. It's not affected by logistics. It is not affected by uh, the market as much. And then lastly, I said this earlier, I'll say this again. You need to focus on the products you can make the most margin on. You will have less customers, right? What did we say? 13% less customers? If you're going to have 13% less customers, every customer matters. And what you have to do is make more money on those customers, right? You just have to. And and I just to turn your attention here to the right, what you'll see is these kind of screenshots of um, a report that we looked at recently, which kind of called this out better, you know, summed it up better than, than I could even sum it up. The first screenshot you'll see is says, uh, manufacturers and retailers who do not invest in talking to the consumer will risk losing organic share to stickier brands. Why? Because right now, consumers don't know where to turn. They don't know which brand to turn to. They don't know which retailer to turn to. They're concerned about their money. 
we have to start talking to the consumers and building a better consumer experience. That way we can make more margin, right? We have to do this so we can make more margin. So anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this presentation. We're going to stay later here today to do some uh, live Q&A. But I want you to remember this. No matter the tough times, the easy times, we still believe that today is the best day there has ever been to the floor covering business. And to get it to be even better, sometimes you have to go through bad times. And we believe that the end of this year is going to be great. All right. And again, thank you everyone for joining. I think there was about 80 people who watched in. So I, I appreciate it. Uh, we're going to get to some questions here. So let's get started. All right. First one, you mentioned manufacturers need to focus on the consumers. How is Broadloom helping manufacturers and small distributors gain exposure with consumers? And I see this came in from actually uh, someone I know at a, at a uh, distributor there in Georgia. Um, so we're doing, let me talk about what we're doing, but let me also talk about what you can do outside of working with us to, to talk to consumers. So at Broadloom, what we're doing is we're launching a lot of really interesting tools to help you help your retailers provide a better experience to the consumers. So some things that have worked really well for us and our manufacturer partners have been um, online visualization, right? So visualizing your products on the retailer's websites, one, uh, two, in-store visualization. So we have, uh, we were first to market with this kiosk functionality where it connects your website and online presence into your in-store presence. And when a customer comes into your store, uh, or the retailer store, they can bring a photo of their living room, upload that photo and see that product in their room while they're touching samples. And you as the supplier or manufacturer or distributor get to control uh, that experience in partnership with the retailer. And then the last one that we see that's working really well is sample ordering. So right now we've partnered with uh, Dixie, um, Hallmark, JJ Haynes, and there's a whole list of manufacturers that we've partnered with and launched so far uh, to do sample ordering. Uh, so what happens is we put sample ordering on your website and sample ordering on the retailer's websites, which allows consumers to buy a sample and get that sample in their house um, delivered by you. So those are some things that we're helping with, obviously, outside of just digital strategy. Outside of us, I would say the thing that you could be doing is marketing your brand. I think today there are, like I said, 96% of searches don't mention a brand. I'd love to see consolidation of brands. I know, you know, you're, you have a brand as a manufacturer distributor and you launch a new collection, a new collection, a new brand, a new brand, a new brand. The problem with that is trying to build brand equity across all of those uh, names is very difficult. It was like when we were, uh, floor force and we were also role master and we were also creating your space and we were also retail lead management and we're also free tail it becomes very hard to manage all those and also um delineate the differences and build all those different brands so we went to just broadloom everything right broadloom uh crm broadloom business management system broadloom websites so i know it's tough but i'd love to see the industry go back that way that way you can put all of your time money energy resources into like this one main brand and start to get it in front of consumers but that's probably a whole other topic for another day but that's some things that you could do what else do we have here what percentage of primary flooring materials come in over the water are affected by these freight and custom issues so i think 85 percent of flooring or a vinyl flooring is made outside of the us um, I'm not sure how many are affected, right? Because it would have to come from that very specific Uyghur, the region, um, in China. I'm honestly not sure. Um, I'd be interested, but I'm, I'm not a hundred percent sure how many are affected versus how much is outsourced per se. Let's see what else we have here. Uh, with a slowdown, would you recommend retail? Oh, what would you recommend retailers do from an advertising perspective? So Listen, I, you can't stop advertising, right? Because that's a snowball effect of, that's not a good effect to your business. You stop advertising, you stop getting customers, money stops coming in, so on and so forth. I think there's probably two things I would, I would do. The first one is look at where you're spending that advertising and consolidate, right? If you were spending money on a lot of top of funnel things like TV 
or uh, maybe YouTube or radio, I would consider looking at that budget and saying, should I put this in more bottom of the funnel towards like Google pay-per-click for instance, right? Because on Google pay-per-click, someone types, a consumer types into Google, flooring store near me, or I want to buy hardwood flooring. Well, these people are raising their hands saying they want flooring. That's the bottom of the funnel. I mean, you can't get any better than that. So I would exhaust your bottom of the funnel advertising and get rid of some of that nice to have um, brand recognition advertising that's top of the funnel. That's probably uh, the first thing I would do. And then the second thing I would do is I don't care if you're using broad loom retail lead management. I don't care if you're using Salesforce, HubSpot. I doesn't matter to me. Make sure you are using a CRM, a customer relationship management tool. Every lead matters. I think over the last four years, we got fat and happy and we, there was so much business that, you know what, if you let a few slip through the cracks or, or when Mrs. Jones calls you and you don't remember the conversation, you have to start over. Like those experiences um, over the last four years, you could just let them fly by and the new customer would come in. Now, every customer is so important. You have to have some sort of CRM or some sort of process to manage your conversations and make sure that no lead slip through the cracks. Uh, so I highly, 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 I don't care what CRM it is. Feel free to look at Broadloom Retail Lead Management or anything, really anything. Please make sure you have a CRM. You're spending all these advertising dollars. Don't forget that you need to send them to a beautiful website once you advertise to them. And then you need to manage your relationships and the customer contact information in something, right? Whatever that is in something. So anyway, that's um, that's what I would do. Will you be doing these recaps every month? The information is helpful. Um, there probably will be every month because I don't think the data changes every month, but potentially every quarter. Uh, I think there's a much better to look at a larger data set than just a month to month data set. So we'll try to do these every quarter, but I'm open to your feedback. If there's something you like, happy to do more of it. Something you didn't like, happy to do less of it. I think there were some really interesting um, geopolitical issues in Q1 that uh, were a little bit unique and different. But yeah, we'll, we'll do something similar, probably with a little bit different spin on it, depending on what the data looks like. Uh, probably every quarter makes more sense than every month. My takeaways is focus on the best product margin. Any advice on how to do this other than pushing it? Should I be featuring it on my website? Um, yeah, listen, I think today, I said every customer matters, right? So I said that as in, make sure you manage every lead appropriately, right? Don't let any slip through the cracks. Now at the same time, every sale matters, right? So if you're going to sell this product and you only have two, if you only have five customers come in your store that week, that means you're only gonna sell, I'm making up a number, four of them. And if you're only gonna sell four of them, if you sell half of them at 30 points margin, the other half at 40 points margin, you're blended at 35. Imagine if you sold them all at 40, right? That 5% really, really matters and goes a long way when you only have those four customers. So I would highly recommend, and uh, shout out to Theral at Floors to Go Texas for giving me this idea. Go around your showroom, print out all of your sales for the last year and go around your showroom and look at the products that you didn't sell at least $5,000 a month of. If you didn't sell $5,000 a month of that display, well, what is it doing for you, right? You're not important to the manufacturer. The manufacturer is not important to you. It does something's wrong with your customers. And I would say, why are we selling this? Why do we give this space in our showroom? Should we just make our showroom more open and um, a better consumer experience by getting rid of it? Um, and then two, when someone comes in, do you want to sell them a product to make 30% or a product to make 40%? A product that could be shopped at everyone at all around the block or a product that you have some sort of exclusivity or some reason why they can only buy it from you and not the person next door. So I don't know. I'd highly look at if you can't optimize the number of customers, well, you know, you can optimize your margin and you really should try to stick at least on the material side to 45 points. If you can, once you get below that, there's no room for error, right? If there's any issues, installation problems, customer problems, you're putting yourself in a tough spot where that project might not even be worth it. So those are the two things I would look at. And obviously featuring on your website is, is critical. What percentage of primary comes in the water? Oh, I think we answered that question, James, but I think, again, I think 85% were, um, 85% were overseas, uh, but I'm not sure all the ones are affected by that issue. All right.
it. And then Brett commented, if you want replacement business, carpet is better than wood and vinyl. I mean, that's true, right? Because carpet cycles through pretty quickly, needs to get cleaned, needs to get replaced. I get that. My only caveat to that, um, and I was actually having dinner last night with Ray Mancini of uh, Belknap Haynes, and he brought up a good point. He said, well, here's the thing. No matter what, every time a house sells, Mrs. Jones wants to redo the floors. So I agree with you that uh, carpet has more um, more turns, right? Like you'll be able to rip and replace it more often. I think what's going to be interesting, though, is if how if you have all these people that locked in lower mortgages, right? 30 year fixed at 2.7, 2.9 or whatever. They're not leaving their house because you, you're in a million dollar house paying 2.5 why are you going to go downsize to a half million dollar house and pay 5%? Like, unless you're paying all cash, it just doesn't matter. You're paying the same amount. So you're seeing a tough re, uh, residential real estate market where the turns aren't happening. And I actually think the turns not happening is going to affect flooring as well. Because when Mrs. Jones buys a brand new house, that's when you can get a turn no matter what. And we've seen a lot of that movement over the last few years. But right now, people aren't leaving their homes and I get it. So that could be something that we look into next quarter. Um, yeah, I think that'd be something we look into next quarter and we can look at uh, how that's affecting flooring sales. But anyway, I appreciate you guys joining us. I got to go hop off to another call. As always, feel free to email me, todd.saunders at broadloom.com or feel free to call or text me, 908-246-7574. Thanks guys and I uh, hope you have a good rest of your Wednesday.